Today's episode of the Outline Podcast is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering the listeners of this show 30 days free and a credit to go towards a complimentary audio book. I highly recommend you listen to Jennifer Lewis's The Mother of Black Hollywood, a memoir. It is amazing. It's about 10 hours of listening time, but Jennifer is hilarious and you get to walk through her journey as a phenomenal actress. Check it out. You can click the link in the show notes or visit www.audibletrial.com forward slash outline pod. Let's start the show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The outline with Kevin Dwayne. Dwayne, Kevin Dwayne. What's going on, you guys? It's the Outline Podcast. I am Kevin Dwayne. This is your weekly discussion of what's trending in pop culture, the LGBT community, and a piece of encouragement for everyone. I have a special guest this week. Goes by many names. I'm going to go with writer, poet, activist, playwright. <laughs> you didn't have that on your eyes, but I know we're going to talk about that too. I have John Collins here on the show today. Welcome. Hello, hello, hello. What up, though? What up, what up? Thank you for joining the show today. Thank you. Um, Thank you for having me. It's a big week for you. we got a a new book coming out. Yes. It's called God Ain't Call Me (laughs) Fag. So, let's talk about this for a second. So, (laughs) when I received the book, because I didn't know the name of it, it was just like, hey, check it out. Cool. We got the book. I kept saying it in different ways with different tones, trying to figure out how you were saying it in your head. I was just like... God ain't call me fag. And I was like, God ain't call me fag. I'm like, God ain't call me fag. And I'm just like, how did you, how would you, how did you say it when you wrote this? How did you say it? Just, God ain't call me fag. That's basically what it is. And I've been hearing different variations of it too as I've shown people the book. So, very like, very much <laughs> yeah. like Jingle uh-huh. uh-huh. I, I, I got you now. I got you now. So, I said playwright because I got to see that twice. Well, no. I was a photographer for the second run. Yes. So I saw it like four times <laughs> that second run, but great, phenomenal play. Like, amazing. Um, so you have a lot of hats. Yes. A lot of hats. Yes. I mean, there, there's your your obvious activism, your, your poet, which you deal with a lot with this book. So tell me something. This is book number four. Mm-hmm. Why this book? <sighs> this book needs to be, you know, I wanted to give a voice to um, the to black gay men who are struggling with their sexuality in terms of um, how do they how do how do they think God sees them and their approach to just how they see themselves, you know, in God's eyes. Um, I'm sitting here sweating because it's <laughs> well, you know, we're under the light. I know. Right? Please, please excuse all sweat. So to excuse all me. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but um, I'm probably a little nervous too. But Don't be nervous. no, so. Basically, I wanted to give voice to a subject that we don't talk about. We don't delve into what our relationship with God actually look like um, in terms of what we express, what we, how we feel, um, what we're going through, what we're thinking. Um, we don't see that side of the relationship with God, that honest, you know, when you're upset with him, when you're upset with yourself. So I wanted to kind of give voice to that. Um, speak to something that is personal to me because I'm a, a church boy. So very much so. Yeah. Kojic, Kojic, from what I read yep. in the book. Okay, yep. so um, in the beginning, because you know I, I try to read everything, so I want to get an idea of what the overarching theme is. You said to yourself, you said, "What is written in this book is a departure from my normal writing style. This book is written in a journal style point of view." Mm-hmm. So my question is, and it is very much like reading someone's journal. Yeah. Now. 
was that just the styling of the book for what so basically was this new content that you just styled as a journal mm -hmm. or is this actual pieces from your journal that you were like i'm going to publish this so okay how this all started about when i first moved to atlanta about five years ago i started a forum for black gay men called on um, john college presents mm -hmm. and basically i would introduce a topic um a taboo topic that and you know based questions around that um just to kind of get a gauge um of who we are as black gay men. I wanted us to see ourselves. Um, so I took that energy. I took those conversations. I looked at my life, my life experiences, and just came up with different essays, you know, based off of what I learned and what I found out, you know, each form that I did each month. Um, I wanted to not necessarily come for the Christian community, mm -hmm. um, but challenge it. challenge it, break down some barriers with, that we have within ourselves, some mental you know constructs that we have about ourselves based off of what we've been taught um, in the church, based on religious doctrine, based off of people's regurgitated beliefs, <laughs> you know, in that system, and tell us, you know. destroy those ideas. barriers, you know, those ideas. It's... Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So... Okay. So you said that you had a, a church background. Mm -hmm. you said you're, you're still a church boy, is what mm -hmm. you would say. How would you identify? So let's get into that. Okay. How would you identify your belief system now? So I still believe in God. I just don't... A lot of the ideals that I held on to in, in terms of being um, raised Kojic, I don't, I no longer hold on to. Um... I still pray. Um, you know, I just don't believe in that whole Father, Son, the Holy Ghost, the mm -hmm. Holy Spirit. I don't believe that um, the Bible is the inherent written word of God. You know, it's a version of what, you know, men saw or believed, you know, God to be or be doing during those time frames. So I steer away from that, but I, I, I really want to focus on just self-awareness, self-love, you know. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. That's actually a great tie and It's funny, I can finally plug this. I, I wrote <laughs> this uh, article for my my good friend, uh, Sensei Raven. Okay. Now you, are you familiar with no. Sensei Raven, Scorpio yeah. Yogi? Uh, he's the guy I do yoga with. I did a uh, a piece for him two weeks ago called No Fear, No Shame. Yes. And I, talk, I talked about my uh, walking away from religion. And I actually have the same thought process as you. Uh, one uh, year after moving here, I um, I decided to just read the Bible from cover to cover, and in doing that, I was like, yeah, no. Nah. And it's crazy <laughs> because so much of growing up in church, you're you're ch you cherry pick. People are giving you verses and they're mm -hmm. telling you this, they're telling you that. You just go off on, mm -hmm. on them. But there's not many Christians who actually read the entire Bible, yes. like actually sit yes. down. And I said, I read all these <clears throat> books all the time, reading what books. In the end, all day, every day, audiobooks. Why can't I just read the Bible from in the end? Mm -hmm. And through reading, I'm like, yeah, no, I, I don't believe this. I don't believe this either. I don't mm -hmm. believe this either. And so I took those principles that I still believe as far as like faith and hope and giving and treating people well. Instead of tithing, I started giving, I started volunteering my time and giving money to actual relief efforts that I could see. And instead of like direct prayer, it became manifestation and, me and meditation. And basically, I use the same principles and use them in different ways and it, it was more of a instead of waiting for something to happen mm -hmm. it was executing things mm -hmm. to make things happen and then life actually got better for me yes and so for the longest time i believed i used to believe the whole idea of god's favor but i'm like but that doesn't make sense when there's people dying in certain parts of the world and it has nothing to do with that but i do believe in the power of flow yes when you give good when you give you get back yes. you so if you put negativity out you get negativity back if you put good out, you get good. And so I started learning just the power of manifestation, karma, and doing things. So I totally get what you're saying of like being aware of self and doing well by others because you want to be treated well mm -hmm. and just figuring out your purpose and giving more to life. So I totally identify yes. with you on that. Yes. So, so is Sharif a real person? <laughs> 
Sharif is based off of a real person. Okay, I just yes. want to be sure. I want to see. <laughs> that isn't much. his name. Over I won't. Well, you got to be safe. Right, you don't want to get sued in these streets. I, I get it. Okay, so he's a real person. He cool, is a real cool, person. Cool. Great story, by the way. Thank you. So another thing that I, I caught with your writing style as well, not only did was it like a series of journal entries, yeah. but you also kind of had this uh, first journal log, second journal log. Like, it was almost kind of like, um, I guess it's a part of, it was part, it gave me part monologue, but it also gave me part like first Thessalonians, second Thessalonians, that kind of vibe. Yes. So it was like you were tying in all these different elements. You tied in internal entries, but you also tied in the Bible, but you tied in like poetry. Because mm-hmm. it felt, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it felt like you will be writing, but all of a sudden it would become real melodic and yes. poetry out of nowhere. I'm like, wait a minute, is he rapping now? <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was on purpose. So right? that was on purpose. Okay. Um, I wanted you to kind of take that journey. It's basically a look into my head. So mm-hmm. you're seeing what I'm going through or what I'm dealing with or what whoever I'm kind of speaking about within that you know particular essay or entry, mm-hmm. um, what they're going through. So I wanted to kind of take you through the thought process. Um, you know how you think things to yourself when you meet somebody, you're like, I wish this Shut up. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. you're smiling on the outside, just enjoying that conversation. Yeah. So I wanted to take a look inside the head and go from there. It was very much like that. It gave <laughs> me, it, it it gives you the sense of picking up someone's composition book and you're just reading it. Yeah. And it's like, while you may not understand everything, you said that. Yeah. You're like, there might be some references you don't get. Yes. But just read it anyway. And I'm glad you gave that because at first I was just like, wait, what's happening? But because then, because it would, it would, you would be telling it, then it would go into something like more poetry. I'm like, okay, I dig the artistic uh, standpoint of this. Mm-hmm. And then it was really, really cool. But then it also leaves room for, I guess, your own interpretation. Yes. There's something else I wanted to ask you since I have you here. You were talking about hearing the words from your father that you always wanted to hear. It was like, I want to say like chapter three or four. It was somewhere in there. Mm-hmm. And was that, uh, was that a moment of acceptance because he called you sir was it was it for me for him that was acceptance for him okay he actually it wasn't i felt like that was the first time he didn't look you know be try to look at me with any indifference you yeah. know he, there was no disdain there there it was an understanding it was like wow my son you know he knows me so he knows my background of course he knows you know my struggle with religion and things of that nature so for him to ask me the question, you know, son, do you really think that God made you this way? And for me to boldly tell him yes, knowing, you know, my, my pops is, you know, deep military, in the church. Right? He a military, you know, all-American hero, deacon in the church. You know, his mother is the mother of our church still to this day back in Detroit. So that's in us, you know what I'm saying? And for him to, you know, accept me for who I am, you know, and to understand that, for my son to come to me and tell me, knowing how I feel about God and religion, period, for him to come and tell me that this is how God made him, and yes, you know, yes, God made him this way boldly, he couldn't do anything but respect that. Um, you know, I wrote, I think I wrote, he went into prayer. It was like this conversation that he had with God, like, <laughs> outside of me, outside of the conversation that we were having, and then he came back to the phone, and he was like, you know what, son, you know, yes, sir. I love you. You know, you're still my son, sir. And that was, <laughs> I was like, wow. You know, it was powerful. Yeah. And I felt that in a way. Like I said, it's very, like, it's very much up to interpretation because mm-hmm. after that, you did go into your mom. Yeah. And it's like a whole section of her. And you used this metaphor that I thought was really dope about taping over. Like, you, I was like, that's a dope, like, <laughs> 90s reference, though. Because I remember your mom had the soaps yes, or whatever. You yes, better not tape over yes. whatever she has. And you had this whole kind of metaphor of taping over what you used to be to her. Mm-hmm. At least that's what I got from it. Yes. I'm like, that's super dope. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that's, that's very clever how you did that. Um, but I felt like there was more of a disconnect with mom than dad. Is that true? Or yeah. it felt like she took it a little harder? Or she still does. It still does. Is that? Okay. Um, it's something that we don't talk about. She, she acknowledges it. <laughs> you know, yeah. but not to the degree that my father does. Like, which is amazing to hear, because yes. that's a flip. Yes. That's a total flip yeah. of things. But. You know, he and I can have conversations about it. Um, when the Supreme Court decision happened, you know, he was like, well, you know, you're going to get married now. You know, what's up? <laughs> you know, so um, he asked about my friends. He's met, you know, some of my friends. And my mother, I've tried to introduce, you know, the, I guess the gay side of my life to her. Um Maybe not indoctrinate her, but to <laughs> just let her know, Mama, this is who I am. You know what I'm saying? But she doesn't, you know, we don't talk about it. She yeah. doesn't want to um, 
acknowledge anything dealing with homosexuality. And that's fine. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So we yeah, allow people to believe what they believe, yeah. but at the same time we can't lose ourselves in it. And yeah. It sucks when it's blood, but you're yes. just like, listen, I, yeah. at the end of the day, this is my life and mm-hmm. I have to live it. And it kind of goes back to that whole uh the cliche statement of like, do you really think I'm just choosing this? Like you think I'm just choosing to deal with this and type of vitriol mm-hmm. and and this is really just out of rebellion. I just hate you guys so much <laughs> that I'm out here chasing dick. Okay, got it. <laughs> got it. Cool. But see, and it's funny because my um my stepmother she she makes the joking comment. Um, you sure you gay? You know what I'm saying? Because I just I guess she has this idea of what gay looks like in her head, and everybody does. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Even we do as gay men. You know, and once you get past that, it's like, oh okay, yeah. You start to see the person for who they are. So I had the same experience with uh, mm-hmm. my mother when I came out to her. I was 19 when I came out to her. And it was literally learning lessons because uh, I I was fearful of coming out because I had an uncle, just like you spoke, you mm-hmm. had an uncle too. Everybody had an uncle in the 80s. You got that one uncle. Right, I had the one uncle who uh, died during the AIDS epidemic gotcha. in 19, 1989, 1990 on the quote. It left a very bad taste in the family's mouth. Mm-hmm. Very bad taste. Mm-hmm. You say his name, people kind of uh, freeze up. Wow. And, you know, they had all these different uh, ideas of how he became gay. And, and I just would crack up because they're like, oh, it was that white man he was with. <laughs> that's who it was. I was like, child, I was yeah, he, was a, he was a cheerleader, girl. Like, what, why y'all playing with me? Like, he, y- y'all said he dressed y'all for prom. Why y'all playing this game? <laughs> Jesus, people see what they want to see. Yes. And so I love a bad taste. But the weird thing is he and I. I was four or five when he died, mm-hmm. but I remember him, mm-hmm. and I remember connecting with him in, a, in just this way of just like, like he saw me, and when he passed, people were like, you remind us of Kenneth, you remind us wow. of Kenneth, you were, and what's funny is our lives are so much, and it wasn't on purpose, mm-hmm. but his independence and his, um, just the way he lived his life was so different than everyone else in the family, yeah. and I'm very much like that too, and it wasn't trying to mimic after him is just kind of how life naturally happened. Mm-hmm. But what's also weird, though, the woman who raised me was not my mother, it was my aunt. I, when I say my wife, when I heard of my mom, I'm speaking of my aunt, because gotcha. she raised me from birth. But she and him were like the best of friends. So it's kind of interesting how she ended up taking me in and raising me. And I don't know if that had anything to do with mm-hmm. it, but it's just, it's just this weird connection to him. Like, I kind of carried the torch on to wow. kind of teach people what gay can be is mm-hmm. not monolithic. Like it's like there's so many different things you can be. And I remember having to teach my teach my mom that like she was shocked when I had straight friends. She's like, oh, so they're still straight? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> She's like, wow, they're still friends with you. I'm like, yeah. Like it's not as right. crazy as you think it is. I yeah. mean, it is, but at the same time, it's just you have to break out the idea. I remember the first time I came home brokenhearted, and she was just like, wow. And she and that's what kind of made her come around. She's like, the first time I saw you come home and be upset. She was like, you know, we're always taught that gay is just about having sex and being promiscuous and just whatever. She was like, when you came home brokenhearted, I mm-hmm. feel like I had to go shoot somebody. Yeah. And she was down. She was like, who I got, what nigga I got to go? <laughs> and that was a moment between yes. us. Like, I'm crying on the couch because I'm hurt. I remember one time I uh I called her and she almost came. Someone was trying to get me out of the house. So they picked me up so I couldn't leave. I'm on guard. Mm-hmm. They're like, I'm kidnapping you. And I was just in my feelings. Like, I was, you know, young heartbreak. Yeah. I'm like, I don't want to be here. I called her. She was going to come and get you. Mm-hmm. And it was just that's when it became real to her. And sometimes we're, we're that representation of that. We have to be. Have to but be. sometimes people don't come around. It was a straight leader that told me the same thing. She said, um, I, until I read your book, I didn't realize that, you know, gay men loved one another like that or could love like I love another man. I'm like, how could you not, you know, yeah. know that? But it's conditioning. Yeah. But it's like most of us, <laughs> I mean, I, and this is the one thing I will generalize most of us are seeking love. Mm-hmm. Granted, we have some fucked up ways of trying to get that love mm-hmm. but we are all seeking love in some kind of way right. it's, it's, you can see it in our actions and our posts and our statuses and our selfies <laughs> you can see it mm-hmm. it's literally it becomes bitter at a point but we're all seeking that love mm-hmm. and it comes from a deeper place because a lot of us grew up being caricatures of ourselves yes. and hiding ourselves mm-hmm. and trying to <sighs> It's, it's 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 a tough it's a tough thing to, to you live in your head for so long. You do you finally actually get to live outside of it. It's like oh my god, it's a whole new world. And then you may be scared, or you may mm-hmm. just 
run wild. You know? Or you're optimistic as exactly. fuck. Exactly. Well, and you at 16, <laughs> by now, yes. I would have four kids. I would have been married. I would have had my one. <laughs> by 19, I found out that niggas was not shit. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, this is a whole nother game. Uh-huh. Okay, I got to figure this out now. Like, all right, reroute. <laughs> but I know I, 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 I get it, but it's all seeking love. But then, yeah. like you said, another chapter in your book mm-hmm. or a journal entry <laughs> self-awareness yes then it gets to a point of like okay i need to love myself mm-hmm. and then one thing about loving oneself it kind of opens a whole other door when it comes to the love front in my opinion it does because you get to see what love actually looks like because if you take care of yourself the way that you actually want to take care of somebody else the way that you say you want someone else to take care of you you have a bond relationship, not only with yourself, but with whoever you come in contact with, especially if they're on that same page. You know what I'm saying? And I think that's a lot of, that's one of the main issues that's wrong with black gay men. Well, with, should I say black gay men? I guess we can't say. It, honestly, it's, nothing's really, <clears throat> I wouldn't say, it's nothing, nothing, let's talk about It's that. one thing. No, that, no, no, no. Let's okay. <laughs> put down. Because you done opened up. Why not? The suitcase. Okay. Okay, because this is actually a conversation I was having recently. Um, what draw and um, when it comes to gay men, yes, but I do think that we as black men have an extra level of complexity because of our place mm. in the world, okay. Because as black men, as black men, okay. or black no, black people in general. Gotcha. I mean, this is this includes lesbians because this male, female, straight, lesbian, gay, this is all of us, but as black people, people of color. Gotcha. Because think about how we're raised differently than any other culture. We have to be raised to be on guard. Think about going to the supermarket. What was the speech that every person got before going in Don't there? Touch nothing. Don't <laughs> ask me for nothing. For right. Shit up but then, the how many times you see other white kids just running around freely doing what they want? It was what it was. Mm-hmm. But that was their freedom because that was yes. their privilege. No one was ever going to call them out. But if you saw another black kid that wasn't you, because mm-hmm. you're going to beat your ass, but you saw another kid, you noticed that everyone was alarmed by it yeah. because it's this black kid who's mm-hmm. doing it. We always had to be raised to have this extra level of manners and respect and this kind of on guard like stay out of trouble do this do that well respectability politics Mm -hmm. rather so we have to deal with that then us as men we have this heavy burden of masculinity toxic masculinity put on us where it's just like you're not allowed to feel man up do this i went to a predominantly white high school i thought everyone was gay there (laughs) <laughs> because white men have a different, I agree what you're saying. they yes. have a different freedom of expression. Yeah. No one questions their sexuality. They're in there doing mock gang bangs and orgies in the locker room, yeah. titty twisters and yeah. mock rapes and the football teams, like crazy shit. Circle jerks yeah. were a real thing. Yeah. And I'm just and I remember the few black people in the school were like, man, they get yeah. what they doing. But that's how we we're, we're taught to have this extreme. We're extreme in all ways, though. We're extreme in our masculinity. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're extreme in our music. Like we we do all the runs. We do all the stuff. <laughs> I remember being in high school, like, why do you guys do all the the acrobatics and stuff? Like, uh-huh. like, no, like it's just style. We like it. It's swag. You like that's what we like to do. It sounds good. Mm-hmm. We don't like that basic sing the tone and seasoning our food. We like to. <laughs> but, you know, we we definitely we show out because it's kind of, I think it's a kind of our way of setting ourselves apart. But some of these behaviors can end up being bad for us in the end, though, mm-hmm. when, especially when it comes to, like, toxic masculinity. Yeah. Like, I, I consider toxic masculinity almost like a jail. It's like a prison. When people are trying to check me on stupid, trivial shit, I'm like, listen, you can be in that jail by yourself. In my world, I can twerk and play basketball. Mm-hmm. I don't give a fuck about whatever <laughs> going on in your world. I don't have time mm-hmm. to police myself like that. Mm-hmm. I'm living life, and I believe in having both energies. You know what I mean? So I think when us dating men dating other black men we're also dealing with a level of the communication tends to be very weak if that makes sense because a lot of us not all of us like i said i try not to generalize but it's hard to a lot of us were raised to not emote but take action it's all like yeah. it's all it's a lot of that and so to raise a boy to not emote and not feel but always take action and be a man and toughen up and then get in a relationship and say oh you need to open up you need to do you need to be more soft you need mm-hmm. to be more it's it's a hard divide mm-hmm. and i and then you add the trauma that a lot of us face as being gay men around toxic masculine straight men and all those things that happen to us 
in that time period, you have that on your mind too. Mm-hmm. So you get you you become grown. You're trying mm-hmm. to have this relationship, and you have all these stumbling blocks that you don't see in other cultures. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And so it, it's a special kind of complexity. But and I think that's why it's a revolutionary act when black men look at black women because we go, ah. Oh, I want to end up with a black man so bad. <laughs> yes. like, I tell people I don't like the pink me. I don't like the pink me. Like I, I really, I want you to can't do the pink man. I, 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 I just, I don't, it's not my thing. I, I love melanin. I love black men so much. I agree but, with I, you. but after dating for so like, I mean, I've been dating what, since I was eighteen. I'm thirty two now. Yeah. So it's one of those things you're just like, what are y'all gonna do? What are y'all <laughs> is gonna work out? But you, you just, but you start kind of realizing the kind of the commonality. And you start seeing it, and there's just a lot of there's a lot of need. There's a lot of trauma that needs to be healed, and you also get to a place where you're just all like, "It's not so much my job to heal you. I can guide you mm-hmm. to where you can go to get it." But you get to a point where you're like, "Okay, I can't be everyone's um, what's it uh, sounding board, yeah. and everyone's like a lot of people. When you're in a relationship, people like to bring their pain to you, mm-hmm. and that becomes." Okay. It because, yeah, and it's a hard feat. Yes. But imagine doing that year after year after year after year, and because these connections aren't lasting long enough, it's like the character keeps changing, but that script is still the yeah, goddamn the same, same, and it wears on you mm-hmm. to the point that you're like, okay, how do I how do I maintain my own self self care, manage my own wellness, and do things like that? And that's when I started kind of going within and focusing on self and my well being. And believing that mm-hmm. one day I will manifest someone that will be on the same kind of level. I got you. If that makes sense. I, I don't believe, like I said, we're not a monolith. Um, we're not the same. Mm-hmm. And I, there's never just one of us. Right. Like, my, so I have some of the best, same, so it seems, friends. Like, what you know, like that we talk about real yes. deep issues and things like that. So I'm like, if you guys exist, there has to be more of you. I mm-hmm. refuse to believe that. I'm only fucking fuck niggas. <laughs> and that could be a personal choice. I don't know. So that's what I'm saying. So that's what I kind of wanted to unpack a little bit more because I do think that being black and gay and male adds this whole other level of complexity that you just don't see. Like, and I, you know, and I, I've seen a lot of other other cultures in their relationships, they just kind of skyrocket rock, past us sometimes. I'm just like, what's that about? And it causes you kind of look into it. I get you, I get what you're saying. I think from that standpoint, we don't get to practice the same type of ritual um, rites of passages as our heterosexual counterparts. You right. know what I'm saying? We don't get to really go to prom. Um, we mm-hmm. don't get to well, at least not what our men. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Um, in most cases, nowadays it might be a little different for these. You know, for the younger generation that's coming up now, I think they can you know go to prom with their significant mm-hmm. others of the same sex. But you know, our generation, we didn't get those opportunities. Um, the generations before us, of course, didn't get those opportunities. So we don't really get to practice being in a loyal or committed type of relationship in our adolescent ages the same time that our um, heterosexual counterparts do. So we carry our adolescence well into adulthood as black men or as men, um, gay men, period. You know what I'm saying? So it takes a while to get over that, especially if you haven't um, really taken the time to get to know who you are. And what you actually want to bring to the table, what you can bring to the table. We're in such a hurry to get, you know, leave home and just be gay. <laughs> you yeah. know what I'm saying? And live this fantasy that we see on TV and that we've created in our heads that we haven't taken. A lot of us haven't. I was. I can speak for myself because I didn't take the time to really get to understand, you know, who I was as a gay man mm-hmm. um, and what that meant, you know, to myself and to a relationship. So. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense, and I, that's that's a whole nother. See, you you bringing out all the topics here. <laughs> yeah. You talk about how we do we take that adolescence into our adulthood. Well, into it's 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 sometimes it feels like a rest of development. Mm-hmm. It feels like like there's been times where I've been in a room a room full of people, otherwise educated. I mean, credentialed, mm-hmm. but those topics are so childish. You're just like. I don't get it. Like yeah. you guys are book smart as fuck, yeah. but we're really talking about the silly. Because when we're gay, we get to go back to being right. teenagers, teenagers again. You know what I'm saying? It's, but it's, but it's, it's like an interesting study mm-hmm. where you're just like, it's like you're reclaiming all that time yes. that you missed out on. Yes. That it's an interesting study though, mm-hmm. and that that's that's a, a great standpoint. So your your adolescent and uh, 
growing up. So would you say a lot of your identity was in church, like just solely, or was it? No, it wasn't solely in church. Okay. Um, bef- <laughs> growing up in Detroit, yeah, um, we were in church pretty much all week. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, one of those. <laughs> we were one of those. But when my dad joined the military and we actually got to move abroad and whatnot, then we still found a church home, of course, that was still, you know, embedded in my dad's, you know, psyche. Yeah, I'm gonna have my kids, you know, as for me and my house, we gonna serve the Lord, you know what I'm saying? And I I um I respect him for that now. I appreciate that. Um but we got to do things as kids. We didn't we weren't one of those church families that, you know, we couldn't watch T V, we couldn't okay. do this, couldn't dress a certain well, you listen to hip hop, yeah, so, so I mean I, mean, I got to be a regular there. teenager. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. It was my parents weren't like you know, they weren't strict like that. Yeah. Um but as far as church, yeah, we went to church and you respected the church, you respected what the religion was, and that was that. Mm-hmm. Anything outside of that, you know what I'm saying, you just carried yourself with moral upstanding. Okay. Mm-hmm. At what point did you start realizing your sexuality? <laughs> well, probably, like I've always known I was different. Um, I think... One significant moment, I I um I was probably like maybe six or seven, and um we went to I had a sleepover with uh, the neighbor's kid, my grand my granny's neighbor's son. He had a sleepover at his house, and I remember going over there. Um, we were real close or whatever, and he had like four of the guy or four of the boys there um, hanging out, and something came on TV. Some music thing came on TV and I started doing some dance. <laughs> and the guys around me were like, they were cheering me on um, to go John, go John, or whatever, whatever they were chanting. There was something that was different about how I felt in terms of the movements that I was making. It, it just felt, I think that was the first time I acknowledged the feminine energy that we carry as gay men, you know what I'm saying? And it scared me. And I was like, wait a minute. It, it just felt different. different. <laughs> and I immediately stopped, you know what I'm saying? Because it, it was, I was like, do they see this? You know what I'm yeah. saying? Do they, are they picking up what I'm feeling? And of course they were oblivious to it, but. Y'all were like six or seven. Yeah, right? <laughs> but that's the first time yeah. I really acknowledged the fact that, um, yeah, something, something is kind of different from the rest of the boys, you know what I mean? When was, do you remember the first time that someone else called you out on that something different? Ha. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm not trying to open up no, traumas no, no, no. here. But <laughs> you know, open up trauma. Because, <laughs> like, I talk about it in the book with the um, pre- the preacher's son. So okay. he used to call me sissy and faggot all the time. And I didn't know what the hell that meant. You know what I mean? I just knew it, was, it wasn't it was a good thing. You know, it was something, you know, that a boy didn't want to be called. So he was really the first one to kind of, you know, I guess, try to out me or what have you. Yeah. And I think around that time, like, I knew, like, I knew what he was talking about, but I didn't know what he was talking about. You know what I'm saying? In terms of what that meant, the gravity of what he was saying um, meant. And I've never had an issue with my sexuality. So him calling me fag, sissy, yeah, it got on my nerves, but it never stung to the point where it was like, um, traumatic or I wanted to crawl up in the ball and die <laughs> but right. from those words, you know what I'm saying? So, so yeah, no, I uh, I think my my first time, I remember being different, of course. Mm-hmm. My first uh, experience, I remember being in first grade and liking this boy, I think his name was Marcus. <laughs> I Why do we always remember the boys? Because it's the first. It's the first. It's the first, it's the first time I remember. I yeah. went, and I remember because I I was homeschooled for like preschool and kindergarten. Because back then it wasn't required until first grade to go to school. So I was like, you know, I was mama's boy, so she kept me. It's like okay, I'll wait, yeah. and then I'll put you in first grade. So I went to first grade, and I remember just being like, oh, so people here. And I remember there was this one girl who called herself liking me, and she was like chasing me around. And it used to drive me insane. <laughs> and I remember telling my mom, like, this girl chasing me because she likes you. I'm like, I don't want her chasing me. You're supposed to like it when you're chasing me. <laughs> Think about the conditioning. Uh, you're supposed right, to like supposed it when a girl like chasing you. Meanwhile, there's this boy named Marcus that I totally like. I'm just like, it was just something about it. And it wasn't even sexual. I'm, I'm what, six? Right. Seven? You don't like, know what that is. It's not exactly. sexual. It was just, 
I was just enamored by this boy. Mm-hmm. And I've been around boys before. I have cousins and friends like that. So you know when it's like a stranger boy, you're just like, why am I so into like it was like this Did you chase him around like the girl chasing? No, 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 but I did want to be around him. Mm-hmm. I wanted to hang out and he was actually really, really nice. And I actually got him in trouble. Which sucked. I felt so bad. But I was a coward. It was, it was. I let him. Bar- I let him borrow a book that I had, okay. but I didn't want to tell my mom that I let him borrow it. I basically like he took it, and I got him a job. I felt so bad. <laughs> I felt so bad. But he was an extra on Full House, mm-hmm. and I crack up because I still see the episode there on Hulu, and I'd be like, "This is crazy." So, yeah, when they went to the museum. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was one of the people who went to the museum with them. So even when I watch the episode now, who like crack up like, oh, he's having a crush on <laughs> But um, I remember that, but it had no, it had no name. Mm-hmm. It had, it was just, mm-hmm. I just let it be. I knew it wasn't what it was supposed to be right. because of what I was told, but I just, I didn't know I had a name. Third grade, after recess, I was, we were, we were in a, it was a weird thing where we were, my class was in another part of the school where it shouldn't have been. It was like in the higher grades. Mm-hmm. I was like in third grade. We were in the fifth grade section. So we're in bungalows. So we're, I remember we were lining up to go in class after recess. And I was just sitting there like this, like but my hands were like this. Mm-hmm. And then this boy named Rob came up and like, ah, oh, Kevin's gay. Kevin's gay. Look how he oh, holds it. Look how he holds his hands. And I'm yeah. just like, what the hell? He made this whole ordeal about it. And everyone just kind of joined in, and I'm just like, I have no idea what that means. Told my mom, she flips, like, who called you that? Don't let nobody call you that. I'm gonna call the school. I'm gonna do like, she like super just over. Somebody you, messing with my baby. Uh, right, you know? Yeah. And then I realized, oh, this word has power, yes. obviously. And so, yeah, but I think we all remember those kind of those moments mm-hmm. that happened. And then it, it seemed like from that point on, it really didn't stop until high school yeah like it always became just the running thread of like well but you know that's the age where boys are being taught by older dumbass men of about these things they don't use straw right man. like <laughs> stupid they shit like that they don't use they kleenex don't, they just yeah. wipe it on their hands right you don't, you don't, you don't cross your legs like, you know. there are men out there who don't even wipe their ass good yeah they think it's good. I see it i'm like if you don't clean your ass <laughs> if you don't, don't want to put that finger up there <laughs> Like you, it's your ass. I don't like. There are legit. Hell, I wish I was lying to no, you. No, you're not. I know. They legit don't wash their mm-hmm. ass good because mm-hmm. they feel that's gay. It's wow. your hole, bro. <laughs> that should be your next book. It's your it's hole. Your... <laughs> like fuck. So yeah, so those things are learned so young, and I know because my brothers used to try to do the same shit to me. But there was a part of me that just it wouldn't stick to me. I'm like, mm-hmm. eh, that sounds like bullshit. Yes, yeah, that sounds stupid. That doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. I was always the one to call out things, and then once I got a voice of my own, which was college. College is when I really started kind of challenging and being like, eh, that's bullshit. And that's when I started kind of. That's why how I got to this place now. Where I'm just like, ah, you can stay in that prison if you want right. to. But now I'm seeing all my well, and we're grown now. I'm seeing all my straight friends and brothers and stuff being more free to just be themselves. They're straight, but they're free to do mm-hmm. yoga. They're free to drink out of straws. They're free mm-hmm. to wash their ass. Yeah. Because they don't, because they, they've grown up. Mm-hmm. It was just at a slower rate. Mm-hmm. So it's an interesting... I wouldn't... People always say they would start over. I, I don't think I, I would go through childhood no, again. I wouldn't. I could, like, ch- children are assholes. <laughs> 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 Middle school kids asshole. Yeah. Well, middle school, I think, is the toughest journey because like, everybody's going through puberty and shit like that. I, you couldn't pay me to go through that again. Start me off at like 17. We can talk there. Because mm-hmm. that's when I started making real mistakes anyway. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> you're grown. <laughs> right. grown. Start me at 17. <laughs> you know, we'll get that credit right the first time. Right. You know, we'll make better decisions in college. But yeah, no, it's, it's hard, especially as a gay man. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know if it's any different being straight. Maybe there's a privilege that happens there. I don't know. But I think we have some type of privilege, too. Yeah. yeah there's a privilege that we have to navigate both worlds. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so. Listen, yeah. that's why I don't get why <laughs> when, like, gay movies come out, they're so terrible. I'm yeah. like, most of us acted straight for, like, 18 right. years. Why can't we actually right. act gay when it's our turn right. to <laughs> Oh, yes. Really? We should be the best actors. Oh, my God. We've had some terrible films. Yeah, we have. I'm like, this is, this is mm-hmm. crunchy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it should be smooth. <laughs> so, yeah. I, yeah. But, no, okay. So, you would say, like, you never really, it never really affected you. I never had an issue with my sexuality. Everybody else around me, you know, had an mm-hmm. issue with it and made it the big thing. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Which is why I capitalized it in the book. You know what I'm saying? So, it's it just, work. yeah, it's just. 
it was always such a big thing. Even to this day, like with my folks, it's still such a big thing. It we really can't is. get past the fucking gay, you know, issue in order to have an actual relationship with one another. Like, I'm not asking you about your bedroom, you know, and that's all they focus on. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so, but you have siblings. Though. I do. I have a sister. Okay. Mm-hmm. Does she have children? Yeah, she does. Okay. And so, she's like, we're cool though. But that's what I'm saying. But they're not missing out on grandkids. Like they just get real At just picky. Because even my mom was like. I want. She said, like, "I want a grandkids." I said, "You have several. I want them from you." I'm like, "Well, what about what? what I'm but you're the only like, boy, though, right? No, you're not. Oh, no, no, no. You have no. a brother. Right? I have a million siblings. <laughs> so I was like, "Girl, you come up with better logic. Uh-huh. Come up with better logic." Just, I want them from you. No, see, I'm the oldest boy, so yeah. now I'm getting it from my dad. Carry the name. Yes, yes. I yes. mean, it's like you can't have children, though. That's what I'm saying. It's not the way they want you to have them. He no, he's not even on that. It's just. When you gonna have a grandson? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And I'm like, Fox, I don't even know if I want a kid. But I gotta find the nigga you know that too. <laughs> <laughs> but this society, I don't even know if I want to bring a child yeah, into this dog on world. You know, it's yeah. super tough. Yeah, it's it's interesting. We I do understand that we crush ideals for people, mm-hmm. especially our parents, especially our families. But that's their shit. Mm-hmm. That's not ours. And that's kind of the beauty of life too is realizing this life is mine. Yes. And then when it's all said and done, I have to be happy with it. And I know so many people who stayed closeted, who went along the way their family went, and they're literally depressed and just don't enjoy life at all. At like, all. and it's, it doesn't, I feel like it's almost a punishment hmm. in being closeted. That makes sense because it's their punishment. It's, it's, it's a personal it's, punishment. That's the choice. It's the cho- yeah, exactly, mm-hmm. and it's also like it's it's. I hate using the word coward because I know it's tougher than that. Mm-hmm. It takes a it takes a lot of courage, and that's why I don't I don't give Dio niggas credit. <laughs> I can't stand when people act like I'm like, sir, you're the coward here. Don't uh-huh. talk to me about anything yeah. about. Oh yeah, I'm on. You know, nobody can clock me. Okay, so you're a coward. Yeah. Like, you got a whole ass family over here because you're afraid to tell your mama that you gay. Get the fuck off of my phone. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. I don't do that. But I do know that it does take a level of courage. It's, mm-hmm. I remember before I came out, I was I went through reparative therapy because I was blackmailed by another family because I didn't want them to tell my parents. That's, That's how afraid I was. So, yeah. so I know what it's like but when you get that courage and just say, fuck it, yes. I got to get my life back. Yes. On the other side of that is a huge like relief and joy. And so I always <laughs> encourage it. Now I tell people, don't fuck up your household. Like mm-hmm. if you're under the age of like, well now, like 25 at this point, because not many people live alone at these day and age. But if you got a point where you know your livelihood is still under your parents and stuff like that, by all means, don't get kicked out of your home. Well, once you out paying bills and doing stuff, doing if you don't thing. tell these people. I'm gay. Because guess what? They're doing their own thing and living their lives. Right. Don't let them control you. Yeah, you know. So. It, it's, 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 it's tough, though. Like I said, mm-hmm. it takes a level of courage. It does. And, but you have to get to a place where you're like, I love myself. Mm-hmm. And regardless if you're here or not, I still have to live this life for mm-hmm. me. And you can't look at it as if you're losing people. Mm-hmm. They're losing you because mm-hmm. they made the choice. You didn't make the choice. I, I never understood telling someone that they have to be something else to be around you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm acting, though. You're not paying me. Like, I don't... <laughs> who am I doing this yeah. for? Yeah. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting. It's very, very interesting. So, so, you say you're always cool with it. Now, when did you... So, you... Now, in the book, your parents yes, found out yeah. via leaving your notebook. Yeah. So, I... um. So this book is kind of a call back to that journal that I burned. Um, it was a journal that I started keeping when I was probably about 16, 17 years old. And that's when I first started writing poetry and just kind of expressing the whole idea of what this whole gay thing was. Um, <laughs> I was running late for school one day. My mama found it. She came up to the damn school and got me. Right, she said, I got to go yeah, there right yeah. there on that. I'm so all of her, whatever she was thinking. But she was so extreme. Yeah. You can't wait till 3 o'clock, mama? Mm-hmm. Like, you couldn't wait till 3 o'clock? At all. <laughs> it was pizza day too. Right? <laughs> <laughs> like, just all that. Man, that was a long car ride home. I'm yeah. sure. Mm-hmm. So she, you know, throws the journal in my lap. Are you fucking man? And I mean she just kinda goes. Not in. Man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you calling me a home? <laughs> I mean, yeah, you got so. me from school. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And that's how it happened. Um so 
So you, you didn't really get a chance to really kind of... I, 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 my, my heart always breaks for people who don't get to do it on their own. Mm-hmm. Where it's like, I mean, I guess the universe kind of does it the way it's supposed to be done too, so I, I don't doubt that. But it, it does hurt me where it's not like a, I get to come to you and say this is who I am yeah. versus me being thrown into it and then right. I'm I'm shocked. And I had to make all these decisions, you know what I'm saying, based off of that one event. So yeah, you know, that part, it that hurt me more than anything, you know what I'm saying? Because it was like, damn, you know, mama, <laughs> you know people that are gay. You got a, a brother that's gay. You, you know, it's just, how can you you know, treat me like this or, or um, just curse me out like this. You know, I'm still the same little John that you, you know, knew before you found my journal, but it is what it is. So, no, I did not have the perfect coming out story, and that's fine. I don't think anything. You know, <laughs> you know. And, and I think that's what I learned, because I'm from, I'm from California, and I learned, though I had my shit there, mm-hmm. I hear stories in the South and on this end of the U.S., yeah. and I'm like, oh, mine was a gravy train. <laughs> Like, you know what I mean? Like I like I said, I got blackmailed by another family. But then when I told my mom, she was upset that I even allowed them to do that. She's like, wait a minute. So you mean all this? So she was just upset at that part. Like, yeah. that's crazy. She's like, I still love you. I don't mm-hmm. really care for that. But like, it is what it is. And that was the relief. And at that point, it became me teaching her things over time mm-hmm. about gay culture. So is that when you accepted yourself? Or did you? Well, yes, yes, very much so. Um, it was one of those things like I, I went through these stages because of religion. I went through these stages of like, fuck this, I'm gay. <laughs> now I'm sinning. Fuck this, I'm gay. Now I'm sinning. Yeah. So I did a lot of back and forth. Back and, forth. and like and every time I got my heart broke, oh, it's because of sin. Like I, every time I, I got done wrong, oh, I got to get back in the church. This is the Lord's way of telling me that. And so I, I did that until I got to a point where I was like, okay, I need Beautiful. to reconcile. Wow. You got to reconcile the yes. two. And that, I think that's the hardest thing. I think that's why I appreciate it. The book, too, because you talk about reconciling. You're like, listen, these are two things that aren't changing. Mm-hmm. I have a faith, but I'm also a gay man. And neither one of these are changing. So I need to figure out how to make you guys connect. You know what I mean? So, um, but yeah, I was definitely, um, after my, you know, after my mom knew, I didn't care about anyone yeah, else. Yeah, and that's generally how it is. It mm-hmm. was just like, that's the big one. Mm-hmm. I mean, it just did, it didn't even matter at that point. And my dad was cooler than her. In fact, she kind of, she lied on him. I won't say lied, but she did with the, oh, well, don't tell him, you know. She'll <laughs> be really upset. He was pissed when he found out, and I didn't tell him. He mm-hmm. was like, oh, she told me not to. He was like, why would you tell him not to tell me? Yeah. It became this whole thing where it's just like, stop speaking for people. Mm-hmm. Like, it is what it is. They're both, they're no longer here anymore, but I'm glad that I got to, they left this earth ex- accepting of me, that's and that's so. all that really mattered to me. Like, it it wasn't even a thing, it was never a thing. Like, it was like, we're going to talk, and we move the fuck on. Mm-hmm. When are you graduating college? <laughs> How's the job hunt going? You know, it was all these things. Now, yes. my mom didn't like anybody I ever dated. Ever. <laughs> like, she, that was not happening. Like, I could bring gay friends over. Yeah. Oh, hey! If she thought we were dating, I don't want them in my house. I don't want them near. One dude, she called me. Why? She's like, why is he parked in front of my house? I said, we're not even there. She said, I don't want to park in front of the house. I said, you were petty. Why? Was it? Well, I thought she was just hating, just on the sense of it. (laughs) But when we broke up, we we talked about it. Because honestly, I didn't talk to her for almost two weeks Mm -hmm. because I was really upset. Because I was like, why are you being so evil for no reason? Like, mm-hmm. he's done nothing. Mm-hmm. Like, I've done nothing. I don't get why you're being so stern about, no, I don't want him near that. What? And then we didn't talk. And then finally I came around. Because, you know, black mamas don't come around. <laughs> you got to come around and be like, hey, mama, yes. I bought you some cupcakes. Uh-huh. You know? Yeah. <laughs> ain't no, like, she can be dead wrong. You ain't going to get no song. Right. But I miss my mama. It's yes. my mama. And so uh, we were talking. She was, and we, It was after we broke, he and I broke up. She was like, she was like, Kevin, I didn't like him because he was afraid of himself. She's like, he walked in here, he couldn't even look me in the eye. It looked like he looked like he was ashamed. How are you gonna be with someone who's ashamed of even being who they are? Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, look at you knowing. Okay. And so it was like, she was like, no, that's not someone you should be so with. So she saw how that was gonna affect you in the long run. Right. She was that weird. I was like, okay. oh, mama be nothing. Yes. Okay, I thought she was hey, she was like, no, she was like, he came in here scared, looking down, mm-hmm. like he was ashamed to be in the house. Like, no. <clears throat> I was just like, oh, I thought she was just being evil. But, 
you know, and that's one of those things. And it's weird though because he and I are actually good friends now. He's like, oh, and I told him, he's like, oh, that makes sense. And he's super out now. I said, see, if you would have been super out seven she years ago, you. you know, you would have mm. been in the favor. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so yeah. And after that, it's just it nothing really affected me. I learned that this, like, once again, it was my life to live, yes. and I'm happy I made those choices because I was so close to being so deep in the church. Like they tried to get me, like through reparative therapy, they tried to get me to like be like kind of like Andrew Caldwell. I know how that happened. That's why I try not to be evil, or I try not to send negative energy to anybody, you know, whether I know them or not. But you, you know how people drag him yes. because of the whole "I'm not gay no more" yeah. thing. But if you've been in church, you don't, the pressure for that, especially when they know you're struggling with same-sex attraction, they try to get you to do things. I remember they were like, we want you to tell us where all the old clubs you went to, and we want to go up there, and we want you to go inside and, and bring people out, and then we want you to get on this thing. Like they, they set you up with these platforms just so you can denounce homosexuality. Wow. It, it's just like that. And there's monetary things that come with that. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. Dude. So it's so easy to fall into it. I could have easily fallen into that because you get into these communities. Where you and that's in LA? Yeah. You get, you get into these communities where you want to be accepted. Yeah. And I'm just like, that could have easily been me and I'm glad that it wasn't. Because Lord knows I don't want to get dry no, by the black community. Oh, <laughs> no. Ruthless. No. Hey, <laughs> Cancel. Yes. <laughs> so, but that could have easily been me because yes. I remember wanting to be accepted <clears throat> and also feeling that I was in sin and feeling that way. I was just trying my best to be straight. So I'm mm -hmm. like, if this was going to take to get my stripes. Then you feel like you're out of the loop with your family. Right. Nature, so and it's like, and yeah. then they were all happy. Like, oh, yeah. Kevin, I'm so proud. I was getting, oh, I'm so proud of you. I can get anything I want from but people. But you're miserable inside. I was miserable mm -hmm. inside. My entire senior year of high school was, I was depressed. Like, depressed. And then it happened a few times in college, too. I remember I was celibate for a year. Ooh, Jesus. <laughs> I had my first wet dream at 22. <laughs> Because I wasn't masturbating either. Oh, wow. Okay. And then one day I was... Oh, so you were serious about it. I was trying. I yeah. literally was trying. And I got to a point I'm like, I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, I literally had a look in the mirror. I'm like, I can't do this anymore. This is not changing. I'm not changing. This is who I am. And I got to a point I'm like... And see, I wonder how many of us go through that. Because I had that period as well um, where it was like, I just felt like I wasn't getting any anywhere with my parents in terms of getting in to accept me or to love me the way I felt they should. You know, and I um, went to a church service and just kind of got lured into that whole, you know, that emotional aspect of, you know, your sin and it's wrong. You know what I'm saying? And they're, you know, they're speaking about it, but not saying it. You know what I'm saying? And you just kind of just feel like, oh, you know, you take on that guilt and that shame or whatever. And, you know, I went home and threw away porn. I threw away magazines. I threw away anything that was pretending to being gay. And I was like, I'm really going to. You know, you try to. I make had to. Re happy. I had to replace my sex in the city <laughs> and my will and grace. Yeah. I threw away all my house music, dude. Right. Like, and I bought it all again. Yeah. I said, like, I need all exactly. this. I got the better exactly. edition. Bro. <laughs> they had better box sets that's by then. But uh, yeah, I did the same thing. Mm -hmm. You you go through this purge. Yeah. Because and that's what, and that's how I knew. I said, God, if I'm doing all of this, if I'm doing all of and this, you still feel the same. And what what's the point? What is the point? Mm -hmm. But then I started grappling with that. I'm like, how can an all-knowing, omnipotent God who knows everything, all that shit, free will or predestination, whatever you believe, mm -hmm. then put this on me and say, oh, you chose it. That doesn't make any sense. Right. You get to a point, you're like, okay, logic doesn't work. This is it's beyond that. Right. I'm here to teach you all a lesson. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. Because <laughs> I thought to put people out too much. <laughs> but the family that kind of <clears throat> blackmailed me had something very common to the gay community hit their home very hard recently. Mm. Which lets you know that it was like a textbook case of projection. Gotcha. So obviously, while you were hiding your shit, you were putting it on mm -hmm. me. Like I said, we, I was there to teach them a lesson, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about converting me. It was about me showing you what freedom looks like. Because yeah. you obviously didn't have That's it. awesome. And so, yeah, you got to look at it that way. We all have a purpose. It is not to be in the box that people put us exactly. in. And that's the craziest shit. I think from the time we're born, it's like, what, can we, what box can we put you yep. in? And it's us literally just tearing that shit down. Mm -hmm. Like, no, let me be who I am. Mm -hmm. So, sheesh. So, 
let's move on to your um, towards the the latter part of the book. You start talking more about. I guess I mean you talked about BGC. I said, listen, grow <laughs> back. Yeah. Like I'm seeing the blue screen. <laughs> Right now with the little basketball player. Yeah. Those men who don't exist. Yes. Hyper masculine <laughs> hat with the chain and the do rag Go back to B-Boy Blues, kind of, yeah. Man, but yeah. let's talk about kind of like those experiences. Uh-huh. It's like, this is more, which is like college age? Or what, what would you uh, say? BGC, Just, well, for me, military age. I was in the military, so like, Navy. Um, <laughs> This is probably during my Chicago phase when I was on the whole BGC tip. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what, what do you want to know? What was, what, was your, what was your name on there? What was one of your names? I don't even remember. Those names just be scandalous as fuck. <laughs> right. I don't even remember. Probably like Hot Johnny or something crazy. You I don't know. You put mask in there. No. You can always tell the, the old heads like when they talk to you in, in current times yeah. they be all like oh yeah mask, mask. cat here <laughs> checking you out. Who says that? <laughs> that what is checking you out with me <laughs> like it's it's such a, a throwback i'm like uh-huh. oh, yeah, you still got an a for a profile right now like, <laughs> i can tell right now but yeah no uh no i just i just kind of wanted to kind of progress so um what was that journey like for you once you got to this place where you still where, where you <clears throat> always you see you don't have a problem with it but were you still were you discreet with your endeavors or um, were you kind of in the navy yeah i was discreet but you know folks knew like there were Every command I went to was at least a couple of people that knew that I, you know, could trust and talk to. Um, it wasn't anything that I, I've never hidden my sexuality, which is the crazy part. It was something that I just always, you know, accepted. This is who I am. You know, I've never, the way you see me now is how I'm always, you know, so it's, it wasn't like, you know, I was what people would consider flaming or what have you. And just, you know, you're throwing it in my face all the time. So. When I was in the military, yeah, people knew. Um, I had, you know, some issues, you know, but for the most part, it seems like you can hold your arm. I mean, you in the military, you know, yeah, like, you know, you like, can call me gay. You ain't gonna hold, beat my ass. Right. Oh. <laughs> you ain't gonna do that, <laughs> right? That's right. You ain't gonna do this job better than me either, though. Right. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, we always go above and beyond to kind of overcompensate. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's rough. It's rough, mm-hmm. but it's also part of like. I guess the part of the privilege too. I mean, mm-hmm. I think it's just always this thing where people know you're gonna get the job done. Because yeah. even in my job now, like they're very accepting. Like it's not a. I mean, it's a Fortune 100 company, mm-hmm. so they're gonna be on the the non suit right. Type thing. Right. But at the same time, there is this kind of level of like Kevin's gonna do a good ass job on this. <laughs> right. You know, this idea of like it just it's in the makeup or some shit right. like that. I don't know, but that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay. Cool. 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 All right. So. When it comes to this book, and I mean, however you want to do it, what is it ultimately? What are the what are three things you want people to get out of it? Ultimately, I want people to get an understanding of, them, of themselves. Um, I want them to come to a place of self love and self awareness in terms of who they look like to God. You know, try to visualize yourself. You know, what what does God see when you? when he looks at you, you know, if we're all images of who we are, of who he is, then we're extensions of God. That means we're low key, all the same. You know what I mean? We're the living body, you know, if you will, of, of who he is. Um, we're little gods just mirroring a big God. You know what I'm saying? So why can't I be an extension? Why can't my purpose as a gay man be an extension of what it is that he wants me to spread to whoever it is that, you know, I'm connected to. Um, so I want people to get, you know, self-awareness from it, um, self-love. I want us to, um, do that so that we can be a part of restoring the black community. You know what I mean? I think we, I mentioned that in the book. I think that we are the key to that. Um, we're hurting right now and our community needs all the help we can get. So we can get past sexuality <laughs> something so minute so minute <laughs> you know what i mean yes you i don't, I don't understand heard about why it. is this a thing yes you know? like we got too much going on like i mean look how they're crucifying the gentleman that started black lives matter you yeah. know it's just and yeah that's one <clears throat> thing we can rally for people and still be disrespectful and still be disrespectful and mm-hmm. i'll add your third one you want to provoke the very way we view vulnerabilities <laughs> and freedom yes 
it's a vow. All right. And I mean, no, I think this is this is a great tool, and I, I hope so. Tell people where and when they can get this. All tool. right. So, God didn't call me fag. <laughs> this is going to be available um, May 26th on Amazon and iTunes. Um, I'm releasing it in Dominican Republic at the LGBT Arts Music and Culture. Which I've been plugging. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's gonna yes. be a big thing. Thank you, Gregory Douglas, for putting that together for the community. It's a big thing. Um, so yeah, that's where I'm gonna be releasing it. That's the launch for it, May 26. It'll be available on all um, Amazon, iTunes. You can get personal copies from me. Um, I can be reached at John Collins Presents at gmail.com. Also, John Collins Presents on IG. So nice, nice, yeah. nice. Mm-hmm. Also, well, great book. I hope <laughs> it reaches people and gets all those things across. Yes. Um, yeah, great conversation. Thank you for being Thank on you. the show Thank today. You. Thank you for having me. All right, you all. This has been the Outline Podcast, and I will keep you all next week. Peace out. All right. <laughs>